Stan Gibalisco here with a little more discussion about mobile radio operating. Mobile meaning generally in your car or small truck like a pickup like my old number seven. I talked uh, the last time about the basics of the installation, where I put the radios themselves, how I connected them to their source of power, and how I connected them to their an antennas and the way to attach the antenna to the vehicle, provided that uh, it doesn't get too windy. And I harped a little bit about safety issues, and again, I would like to mention that you need to be careful about what the laws are in your jurisdiction before you use a two-way radio in a moving vehicle. That said, this has to do, of course, with making everyday electronics work and I allude to, to two uh, fundamental problems that you're likely to encounter if you try to operate a radio uh, in a two-way a two-way radio in a motor vehicle. And the problem tends to be worst on the lower frequency bands like Citizens Band and the ham radio so-called HF bands, high frequencies, short wave, back in the days when those frequencies really were high uh, by comparison to what else was being used. Uh, generally in the range of 3 to 30 megahertz is called the high frequency band. Not so high anymore by today's standards. But sometimes it's also called short wave. In college, when I was in the fraternity and set up my 700-watt radio station in my fraternity room and ran a dipole antenna with open wire line from the top of the fraternity house down to a tree in the parking lot and operated when the brothers uh, in the fraternity weren't using their stereos or didn't mind uh, if I had a few minutes, they called me shortwave. It's the wave! That's what they used to call me. Now, I've, since then, I've been called an awful lot worse. So maybe I should go back to that, be called shortwave. They, they actually made a chalk drawing of me, at a like a disc jockey. And they called me shortwave, and they had me, you know, uh, it was it was kind of fun. They did that for everybody, though. They made these chalk. I still have that, by the way. It's right up on my, the wall in my nerd cave. I'll show it to you sometime. Anyway, making everyday electronics work. It's just kind of a casual, um, one might say, amalgam of tidbits and tips on how to get the most out of your everyday electronics. And if you have a two-way vehicle in your car or truck, that's everyday electronics. Here's the first source of problems that you're likely to encounter. And again, I... I I did allude to the fact that these problems tend to get worse as the frequency goes down. If you're up on the VHF bands, very high frequency, like ham radios on 144 or 432 MHz, uh, not so much of a problem, but this is an alternator in case you haven't already guessed. And as it operates uh, and the engine uh, runs it, turns it by means of this belt that you see down here at the bottom. It's like a motor except backwards, like a little generator. And it has a tendency to create a noise which they call alternator whine. Whine. <laughs> All right. It's not so much like the whining of a little baby, like a little child, as it is like the whining well, kind of an ee and the pitch of that whine varies as you press down on the accelerator. And if you're hearing that in your radio, even in your, your hi-fi system in your vehicle, you might have a problem with this. If you hear that noise and if it changes pitch when you, if it gets higher in pitch when you press down on the accelerator, you know that's alternator whine. Now, there are ways to help to filter that out. Uh, you can put a filter on the line between your radio and your power source. Those lines are open wires. You can, in fact, use coaxial cable for that line if you want to, with the negative ground, the negative grounded being the shield of the coax. 
coaxial cable and the positive being the center conductor. That is one way to try and reduce that. There are filters uh, available that you can get. Go on the internet and Google on alternator whine. But oftentimes this problem is virtually impossible to get rid of. And it's a real pain in the you know what if it gets very loud. But anyway, there's another form of noise that you can do a little bit more about. And that is ignition noise created by the spark plugs if you have a vehicle with spark plugs. An internal combustion vehicle. And this is what impulse noise looks like if you were to view it on an oscilloscope. Uh, color inverted of course so that the screen is light and the waveforms here. These spikes every time a spark plug fires you get a zap, a spark, and that creates a little electromagnetic field creates an electromagnetic pulse, a very weak electromagnetic pulse, but nevertheless a broadbanded electromagnetic pulse all the way across the whole radio spectrum, but worse as you go down in frequency generally. You'll hear it on your radio as a series of pops, uh, rapid fire pops. If you press down on the accelerator, um, you may hear this as a almost like a buzz but it's not like alternator whine it doesn't sound like that pitch a tone with definite pitch it sounds kind of like a buzz or a series of pops there are noise blankers and noise limiters in most two-way radio receivers if they're a good one that'll really help a lot with this kind of noise and there's an there are other ways to deal with it too you can get special noise reducing spark plugs resistance uh, plugs or resistance wiring. I remember I had an, a high frequency mobile radio station back in the 1960s and 70s. My early ham years when my dad let me drive this old 1967 Oldsmobile. Remember Oldsmobile? Anyway, this 1967 Oldsmobile I put at Halicrafters FPM Fox Papa Mary 300 transceiver ham radio transceiver in it there weren't a whole lot of those made I guess and they don't exist anymore but it was all transistors except for the final amplifier was a vacuum tube maybe the driver was a vacuum tube it had a 200 watts input about 100 watts output and I used to operate two-way radio with that mobile CW that's Morse code and voice back in the days before they really worried much about distracted driving and uh, I operated that thing and made some DX contacts on uh, 14 megahertz ham radio band with that radio but there was this problem when I first installed it with this ignition noise and it was just overwhelming it was just overwhelming well I took it into the shop and the guy wired it up with some special spark plugs of some kind or another. I don't remember exactly what he called them and what kind of wiring he put in, what he did, but it really helped an awful, awful lot. Which was good because this uh, particular radio, I don't believe it had a noise blanker. Maybe it did, uh, but it, it certainly wasn't uh, that effective against the original impulse noise that came with this vehicle. So you can deal with that alternator whine not so much that is a real pain in the patootie if it's very loud and it's very hard to deal with but those are two problems that you'll encounter a third problem that you'll occasionally encounter is if you're driving on a highway next to high tension power lines you will hear noise from those lines particularly then and once again that gets worse at the high frequencies, particularly below 14 megahertz or so. It is that uh, power line noise can be a problem. Fortunately, once you get away from those power lines, that noise goes away. So those are three bugaboos that you can consider when you're operating mobile in a two-way radio. There's just one more little tip I'd like to give you. If you encounter a heavy thunder shower when you're driving with a two-way radio and the antenna is out in the back there on your 
disconnect that antenna from your radio at least. And if you can, if you have a mag mount, pull that antenna in. Get it off of there. Because <clears throat> although you're probably pretty safe in the vehicle yourself from lightning, your radio could easily get fried if lightning struck anywhere nearby. The electromagnetic pulse could could fry your radio. So don't try to operate one of those things or use it in a heavy uh, lightning storm. So with that, I will wrap up this little amalgam of strange tidbits and tips. Stan Jibalisco signing off. Until next time, check out this book on my website, sciencewriter.net. You can go up to the top there in the Amazon link and my book will be right there if you want to get it. I encourage you to do it if you like uh, little tidbits of this and that and the other. Stan Jibalisco signing off from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America. So long. <laughs>